Welcome to the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast, where we interview the world's leading CEOs, business executives, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and authors. Our mission is to learn the strategies and tactics that have helped our guests succeed in business and life and share those lessons with you so that you can become the Bulletproof Entrepreneur. My name is Chia Dogu, and I'm the co-founder and COO of Dogu Media Group. Dogu Media Group is a podcast marketing and new media agency that helps corporations create and amplify their story via high-quality branded audio content that builds a community of highly engaged fans who are their ideal clients for their premium products and services. And now, without further ado, on with the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur podcast crisis management edition. So I've called this the crisis management edition because we're recording in a time when we're all dealing with the global pandemic and there's lots of challenges around the world. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, how can I help you, the listener, solve your problems so that you can come out of this better and better positioned in your business and in your life. So with that said, I've brought several speakers to speak. And my guest today, who's going to teach us how to become better problem solvers, because right now, I think what we all need the most is how to become good problem solvers so that we can tackle the right problems and succeed and get the right solutions that will help us in our lives and in our business. So my guest today is Thomas Weather wells He's a management consultant, executive advisor, and keynote speaker. He's the author of the new book, What's Your Problem? How to Solve the Right Problems. The book actually has a forward here written by um, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. So you can imagine if Eric Schmidt endorsed the book, that means, of course, the book is really top-notch and you should actually want to hear what Thomas has to say. Thomas works with executives in companies around the globe, teaching them how to become better problem solvers. His research has been featured in Harvard Business Review, The Sunday Times, Telegraph, BBC, Bloomberg, The Financial Times, and more. He was rated by HR Magazine as one of the top 20 international thinkers of our time. He's a keynote speaker. He's helped several companies from Credit Suisse, Deloitte, Wall Street Journal, United Nations, and a lot more help them overcome their challenges by teaching them how to solve the right problems. I'm pleased to have Thomas on the show today to tell us a little bit more about how to become better problem solvers. So with that said, Thomas, welcome to the show. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Chi, and thanks for that warm introduction. My pleasure, Thomas. My pleasure. So before we get into the meat of the interview, let's talk a little bit more about yourself and your background. So tell us a little bit more about your origin story, how you got to where you are today. I am uh, originally Danish. I lived the first 30 years of my life in Denmark. And at some point, I started traveling abroad. I started working with an old professor of mine. And uh, he and I, we, we published a book on innovation seven years ago here which is basically lessons on how to innovate when you have a normal job. And that really came out of all of our work with companies and people who who were struggling to make that happen and some who succeeded. And so I've been based the last about eight years in New York, uh, where I am right now. And I have uh, focused here recently on this question, as you said in your intro, about how to get better at problem solving and specifically solving the right problem. So it really came out of this. I'm a weird mix of academic and uh, practitioner in the sense that I I advise companies on how to get better at this in general. Mm. And I also see here in your LinkedIn background that you were in the Royal Lifeguards in Denmark, correct? Oh, that's right. But uh, I mean, that 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 sounds more impressive than it is. <laughs> it's, it's a, <laughs> I mean, I, I spent uh, four years in the Danish army uh, oh, okay. and uh, that in the infantry, and I uh, that was a great time. But it's worth remembering here that the Danish army is not very big. <laughs> Mostly what we did was basically to run around and practice saying we surrender in different languages. So it, it was kind of <laughs> not that. <laughs> um, but, but, but definitely, I think I was talking to a friend recently about what my army experience brought me. And I actually think most people say, oh, it's discipline. And, and that's not true. I'm not very disciplined. But it brought me an appreciation for the need to make things work in practice. Like, I think there's so much great academic work out there that doesn't make the connection down to, okay, so what does this mean for me tomorrow? I think that's why I've managed to get uh, Harvard to publish some of my books that they 
there's a practical connection there, which we'll hopefully explore in, in this talk as well. Cool, cool. So let's jump right in. So your new book is titled, What's Your Problem? To Solve the Toughest Problems, Change the Problems You Solve. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, why did you write this book and what's the subject matter of the book? The core idea is really that there's, in order to make progress on something, there's really two parts we need to get right. One is solutions, like coming up with a solution to a problem. And we're actually fairly good at that already. The part we're bad at is to figure out what problems to solve, like to, to think differently about problems. And that's really what the book is about. It, it's a way to teach you to get better at coming up with solutions by rethinking the nature of the problem. And I came to that because I work with companies for, I think, 12 years now. And it just struck me quite gradually like, that people are bad at this. Like it, it's something we you can intellectually understand it pretty rapidly, but having the skill of actually doing it was something I felt was a big missing tool in our in our toolbox, if you will. And so after having run into enough companies and, and leaders who were bad at this, I figured I should write a book about it. Mm, okay. So now tell us a little bit more about, you know, what the art of reframing problems and what we need to start looking at problems in a different light. Because like you mentioned, um, yes, I mean, we all grew up in schools where, okay, you're taught, here's a problem, you solve it, and you solve it within the confines of what the professor or the teacher gives you. But reading through your book, I noticed that most of the times to solve a problem, especially complex problem, you can't just look at it from the narrow perspective of what is presented in front of you. It's counterintuitive to what we were taught in school where only look at the facts. And now you said, okay, we need to bring in things from outside our scope of understanding, as well as maybe even outside our own realm of expertise in order to solve the problem. Exactly. And you say that exactly right. In school, we learn, oh, here's a problem. You should solve it. In the real world, problems almost never come to us that clearly. Like It's not as if just somebody says, oh, this is the problem. We already know that's the right thing to focus on. So part of this ability is to look at a messy situation and figure out what is the thing we should be paying attention to here. So the best way to explain that is through what I call the slow elevator problem. And that's the idea that you imagine you are the owner of an office building and your tenants, they're complaining about the speed of the elevator. Now, what most people do, they start brainstorming on how to make the elevator faster. So the problem is that the elevator is slow. How do we make it faster? But if you talk to people who actually manage buildings for a living, they tend to try something very different. Namely, they put up a mirror in the hallway next to the elevator. Because what happens is people look at their own reflection, they fall in love, and they forget that they're waiting. That's an example of, of the core idea that if you're trying to solve a problem, instead of just delving into the problem as it's presented to you, you can actually benefit from taking a step back and saying, is there a different problem to solve that's actually better for us? Instead of focusing on the problem uh, that the elevator is slow, maybe a better problem to solve here is that people are noticing the weight, and that's why they're complaining. So that kind of captures the central idea that you have to take a step back and try to see if there's a way to rethink or reframe the problem you're trying to solve for. Okay, now when it comes to rethinking or reframing, I think, like even me reading through some of the examples in the book, I noticed that, okay, it's very hard to do because your mind is already like focused on like, okay, like we just mentioned, you have the problem of the slow elevator. Now to take that step back and step outside yourself and say, okay, what are the other surrounding things that could help me solve this problem? I identify, okay, rather than, getting a faster elevator, let me focus my attention to, hey, let me entertain them by looking at myself. How does one do that? The very first practical step of this is to get one or two other people to discuss the problem together with you. Because it is just very difficult to see your own blind spots, if you will. We all, when you have a problem, it's almost always the case that you're too close to it to see it clearly. And so it, it helps tremendously just getting one or two other people to discuss the problem with you, not necessarily trying to solve it, but trying to, to ask questions about the way you think about the problem. So I'd say that's, before we delve into the more specific methods you can try to do this, I say that's just the core rule. When you have a problem, describe it very briefly 
to a couple of other people and ask them to try to rethink the problem together with you. So in the book, what I do is basically to share examples of approaches that have proven helpful for the clients I work with. So these are almost different lenses or different perspectives you can try to apply to a problem you're facing. So a good example, for instance, might be to look for what's called bright spots. And a bright spot is when you have solved the problem before or when you have solved a similar problem. So let's say you have a boss that's very difficult to work with and your boss never listens to feedback. Then you try to think, well, was there ever an exception to that? Maybe there is that one day after a meeting or after a conference where you gave your boss some feedback and not only did he or she listen, they actually acted on it. So that's one of the methods for trying to go in and get a new perspective on your problem is ask, is there a bright spot? Is there at least just one positive exception where I have partially solved this problem before or maybe even somebody else has kind of found a good way to solve it? Okay, so we've solved the problem. And there was a good anecdote about, you know, people... The guy that had a problem with his boss and was looking for a job and uh, he decided to find a job for the boss to get the boss out of the way. That was that was a very interesting one. So I think where we should go next is, okay, now that we understand reframing and what it means, let's talk about the other end, you know, getting to the goal. Because I noticed that in the book you talked about, okay, on the one hand, we have reframing the problem. On the other hand, we have to figure out if the goal we are trying to get to is the right goal. So let's talk a little bit more about that. What happens so often with problems is that we have an assumption about what we want to achieve. And then we focus all of our attention on what's holding us back from that. Like It's almost as if it's a physical obstacle or a wall that's kind of in front of us. That's the problem. And how do we get over it or get through it? One of the core lessons from problem solving in the research into it is actually that you need to spend more time thinking about what is your goal? And is there a different way of thinking about what that goal might be? You mentioned, that was one beautiful example. You mentioned it here briefly, but an executive who hated his boss, loved his job, and he went to a headhunter and tried to get a new job somewhere. Then in the evening, he talks to his wife and together they figure out a better goal to pursue. Instead of him trying to look for a new job, could he get his boss to get a new job? So he he took his boss's CV back to the headhunter and said, can you find a job for this guy? And that ended up happening. So that's a beautiful example of trying to rethink, well, success for me, is that getting into a new company so I can escape my boss? Or could success also be getting my boss into a new company so I can stay where I am but without this annoying guy? So that's that idea of really getting a detailed understanding of what success looks like for you. What does winning look like? And is there a different way of thinking about that? I see people apply it in, uh, in family contexts too, right? Where you have, let's say you have a conflict with one of your family members. It could be like a sibling or a uh, mother-in-law or whatever. And yeah, our parents. Or, and we, we often think about like winning. Well, winning is winning the argument. You know, finally, I come out of this discussion we're having and uh, a victory. I won the argument. Is that necessarily the right goal to look for? Because at the end of the day, what we tend to want is to have better relationships to the people around us. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to win every argument you have against somebody. Maybe there's a different goal to pursue there that doesn't depend on your or like rhetorical skills in when, when you fight with them, uh, so to speak. Now, speaking about this, I think it makes perfect sense when you bring it to the world of relationships and dating. And I mean, your, your examples were so great. You had a nice example about dating profiles and how uh-huh. profiles change based off of um, people's um, interactions with the app and going on dates and whatnot. But yeah. applying reframing to that context and to relationships, how can interpersonal relationships be better when you look at it from the re- reframing, changing the, the dialogue point of view? Because I noticed yeah. that majority of the times it's a communication issue that causes couples to actually get into lots of conflict which leads to divorce, break, breakups and whatnot. Very true. And I think I, I'll share the example you, you highlighted here as well. But sure. the, So this is one of the other 
ways of trying to reframe a problem. And I, I call it the art of looking in the mirror. The idea of asking when you have a problem, well, we tend to think it's because other people are idiots and you're the innocent victim. Very often you can make headway on a problem by asking, in what way am I part of creating this problem? If your team doesn't do what you want them to do, how are you leading them? If your children are you know, not doing their homework or there's some other conflict, what is your role as a parent in creating that problem? That's, it can be quite painful, but it can also uh, sometimes highlight ways forward. And the, the example I share in the book, it's uh, really when, you, when for, for those of your readers or listeners who have been on the dating scene and specifically on a dating app, you'll notice this thing of people saying in their profiles, no drama, you know, I hate drama. And the example I bring up is like sometimes your own behavior actually reveals clues to things that you may be doing wrong. Because when you think about it, the people who write, I don't want drama in big capital letters on their dating profiles, well, they have, it sounds like they had seen a lot of drama in their relationships. That could be because, you know, they've been unlucky or they live in an area where there are lots of people who are very dramatic. It might also be because at some level, they are part of creating the drama. There's some kind of pattern that they bring into their relationships that cause drama to occur. Or even at the level, I mean, okay, so maybe it isn't fully you, but at least there's a pattern here where you're selecting four people that create drama. So that's an example of thinking differently about instead of, oh, why is everybody so stupid in relationships? Why are they so dramatic? Kind of asking, what do I need to do differently? How am I contributing to these fights we're having or, or this pattern I'm seeing in my life of running into very dramatic people or having other types of conflicts? It's an ability that requires some humility. It requires that you're willing to see yourself in a less than perfect light. The good news is once you're willing to do that, you can often find ways forward that may not have been visible to you before. Now, now, as as we're still on this topic, that also brought me back to a part in the book where you mentioned the difference between correlation and causality. Yeah. So now, in this situation, I also see that it could also probably apply here, where somebody say, "No, I don't want any drama." But unless you step back and say, "Oh, why is every single relationship inbuilt with drama? Is it that I'm the one causing it, or is there a correlation that I have a, a predisposition to select people?" that are this type of personality that don't that doesn't mesh with me and that creates the drama. Very true. And I think that applies to any kind of dynamic, not just dating. So when you look at relationships, when you look at problems at work, if you always end up having a specific and difficult dynamic with clients, like having the ability to step back and say, wait, what's actually going on here? And how can I change things? What am I bringing into this that may be creating this problem, so to speak? Cool, cool. So now, Thomas, um, I want us to dive into a more applied approach now because um, we spoke about this before we started the interview. You know, we're living in a world that has changed rapidly overnight because of the coronavirus pandemic, and um, people have lost their jobs. Businesses have had to close down and shut down. All the borders are closed. We can't fly anywhere. We can't go anywhere. We're almost in a lockdown situation, and this has caused this tremendous stress and strain on business owners and entrepreneurs and even corporate executives laying off people. So now I want you to put on your management consultant hat for a little bit and now say, okay, a company or an entrepreneur going through a problem of either your business has dried up overnight or you have to lay off staff or you're not making sales or whatnot, how can you help such a person use the tools in your toolkit, especially in the book, what's your problem, to start solving their particular problems so they can start seeing results and start coming out of this um, crisis. Yes. So let's take a, a more specific example that you have suddenly seen business drop because of all these changes. So you may be, you know, maybe you've been used to doing in-person consulting of some kind, and now evidently people aren't really meeting up at, at the moment. First of all, when people frame a problem initially, they tend to frame their own problem. 
like they say, my problem is that's you know I my sales are dropping or my income for the next half year is in danger or similar. One of the core steps you have to take in order to solve that is actually to back away from your own problem for a second and try to step into the shoes of the other people in that equation. Meaning, let's say when you think about your clients, what are they seeing right now? Focusing on what problems are they facing? And also thinking about, well, there's probably a lot of other people like me who are now a little bit in a panic and scrambling to get new business or whatever. What are they doing? Like, so you suddenly start thinking about not the problem of how do, you know, how do I secure more income for the next half year, but you try to think about how can I stand out from everybody else given what's currently going on. I can guarantee you a lot of your clients right now are getting a ton of requests for people pushing their solutions or whatever they want to sell to them. How could you then approach that differently? A couple of examples. You might go in and say, this is a good point made by one of the people I know called Scott Stratton, who's an expert in, in marketing. His point is basically, if you're in a crisis, if you're a marketing person or you're marketing something, there's only really one of two things you should be doing. You should either be genuinely trying to help people or you should shut up. And he makes that point because right now, when you think about it, when you think about what things look like from the other person's perspective, they are inundated with people shouting about their services or their products or, or whatever. One good question to ask is, instead of focusing on selling my products here now, is there something I can genuinely help with, with the other people who are out there, a problem they may be having that I can go in and potentially try to solve for? Similarly, another way of thinking about it is, how do I stand out from everybody else? I think I imagine right now, for instance, there's a lot of people who are in my space, they're writing articles about how to work from home. I can guarantee you, if you're sitting as an editor at a news site somewhere, and if you get another article suggestion about how to work from home, you're going to throw that out because we've already spoken about that for two weeks and everybody's tired of it. So an exercise is also to go in and try to say, okay, what is a problem that people may have that we have not yet given good solutions for? Is there something in my clients' lives that is happening right now that's not the first easy answer, like getting better at webinars, but some other angle of taking on it. I, one beautiful example I saw, I literally, just before we spoke here, I spoke with the owner of a big association for professional uh, trade people. And they made the point like, listen, everybody's doing webinars right now, offering some kind of education thing. So everybody on our client side have the ex experience of being sitting and have somebody talk to them, you know, online. So they went in and said, you know what? Let's flip that around. Let's go in and involve our members. Why don't we create a book club? So they would have their members start reading some kind of thing and bring them together and start discussing, having them discuss their own challenges and their own ideas and so on. And they saw tremendous sign-up rates for that because suddenly there was something here that was different from what everybody else was trying to pitch at the moment. Okay, good. So basically, it's not about um, trying to sell, 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 or shout above everybody else, but it's to also look for ways to like genuinely help and be helpful and solve a problem that is not being solved. Now, my follow-up question to that was, um, can you actually help and solve a problem that is not being solved without jeopardizing your income? Because if somebody's business has collapsed, they're trying to be helpful, yes, but they're also in business to like, you know, see if they can salvage some way to make a living during this crisis period. So can they be genuinely helpful without jeopardizing the goal of making money eventually? The question for me is in part, what is the alternative? Because if there was a way right here and now of going out and marketing your services in a credible way that doesn't seem tone deaf, relative to the fact that all the problems are going on, then great. I mean, do that. <laughs> Your choice right now might be to partially accept that you will see some downturn in income. A lot of people are facing that reality right now. 
I don't think that can be fully avoided. So part of the challenge you're trying to solve for is, of course, how do I go in and make sure that I can survive at least the next couple of months without thinking that I will manage to achieve all the sales that I have had in the past? And you, you see different approaches. I mean, this is almost on a societal level. You can see, I don't know what's been going on in Canada. In the US, there's like mass un, uh, unemployment at the moment. Three million people have just become unemployed. In Denmark, where I'm from originally, the government went in and guaranteed the next 90% of people's pay the next three months. So the companies could keep their employees in, on the payroll at least for a couple of months as we figure out a solution to it. And I think on a much more detailed level, I mean, this is in part about if you're working with client, uh, sorry, employees yourself, trying to figure out what's best for them. And find, of course, you know, best for them would be just to keep their jobs on alter, but that may not be possible. Having conversations or even having different options where you go in and say, well, if it is most helpful to you, if you can, for instance, over here, you can get unemployment benefits if you're probably fired, but not if you're just furloughed. So I spoke to a business owner here who deliberately agreed with her employees that they would all get laid off because then they were capable of getting some assistance from the government, at least. There are other people who figured out, okay, everybody's taking, including me, we're, we're cutting our own pay in order to make sure we can keep things afloat. So there are different ways for it. I think one of the important things here is to actually have conversations with at least some of your employees to figure out what their reality looks like. Because if you're just deciding this alone as a business owner, you may be missing things that are going on on the other side where your employees, they may even be capable of helping you solve this problem. Notice this again. When we think about other people, it is so easy, especially with employees, to think of them as children. Oh, they can't manage things. I should protect them from the truth or you know, I should make decisions for them. But I mean, there's a reason you hired people. They're capable people. They're intelligent. And they, if you are open with them and if you explain what's going on, then in some cases, they can actually become part of the solution as well. So that's one of my core perspectives. Instead of thinking like, oh, I need just to make a decision here as a leader and, and roll out that solution, try to involve your employees and treat them as the capable adult problem solvers that they are. Even if you have to make hard choices, I think it'll create a better understanding on the behalf of your employees so they don't just feel that you mandated something from the top. No, they were part of figuring out, okay, we have no choice but to go do this difficult thing or having these layoffs or whatever it is. I think that can make a, a tremendous difference. Now, in terms of, um, so we've talked a lot about problem solving and, and all that, but taking it like um, one step higher Problem solving comes from, you know, brainstorming, getting good ideas, mm. and looking at optionality. So now how can we as entrepreneurs, as business owners, develop ideas that can help us overcome challenges like a loss of customers or attracting customers or just achieving any ob objective? Because you're an idea man, you're an innovation yeah. guy. So this is probably within uh, your wheelhouse and your expertise as well. So tell, yeah. tell us a little bit more about ideas and using and creating different ideas to help solve problems. Well, yeah, I'll talk about this from the perspective of being somebody who is, in, in a very tangible way, I make a living by coming up with ideas. And one idea is, of course, around reframing and the topics of my book, but also the talks I give to companies, the consulting. And so the way I think about this is, again, to step away. I, I have done, in my work, I have done very, very little, little marketing ever of what I do. I have focused almost all of my efforts on trying to find ideas or topics that haven't really been addressed by other people. Like when you think about the challenge of reframing, for instance, that's not something most people are good at. And so I was very focused on in working with my clients. I tried to take a step back and say, wait, is there something here that they're all struggling with? When you look at whoever types of clients you work with or other stakeholders, what are they doing wrong? What are the mistakes they are making that you can potentially help them get better at? Because I think one of the things, let's assume that the, for the next three months at least, you're going to have more time than you normally do because there's not a lot of client work. 
you can, depending on your, your cash situation, you might be in a position to start working on thought leader pieces, if you will. Like what is an article you can write in a publication? What is a, a point you can talk about with, with on podcasts such as yourself? Is there some kind of problem that people haven't really recognized properly or they know they have it, but they don't have the solution for it that you can go in and give good advice on? So that's essentially what I do in my work with innovation, for instance. That was my first book. I realized a specific example that when we spoke about innovation, it was almost always in this context of being in Google or in a like a very creative design agency where we could put on a Hawaii shirt and really be go crazy with ideas and so on. Yet most of the companies I had worked with, they just looked very different from that. They weren't sitting in a garage in Silicon Valley. They were in a inside a big, sometimes bureaucratic company. And I noticed both that that was a problem for them. How do you innovate? How do you, how can you be creative in that context? And I also ran into a couple of bright spots. So, so people who had succeeded doing something creative in a big company. And that led me to go in and talk to them and basically write a book that said, here are some specific tools for getting better at innovation when you have a normal job and you don't have a lot of resources. So when I spoke to my editor at Harvard and I asked her why she first took an interest in my book, she actually said it was, well, everybody talks about innovation, but you had found a new angle on it, which was how to help other people innovate when you have a normal job. And that led to my first book deal and, and to my current business, if you will. So it's very much about, again, taking the perspective of your clients and trying to spot patterns that other people may not have seen. How, could, how can you go out and see a problem that is not properly solved? And can you then start writing about it, talking about it, writing a book, maybe that's a little bit of a longer term project. I, it's often a good idea just to start with an article, but really start to work on your thought leadership, on your status as an expert, because that has been, at least for me, that has kind of been what led clients to come to me. My uh, sister-in-law, is a, uh, she's an expert in crisis psychology. She lives in Denmark. And she see, she's seen the same thing because she's been very good at positioning herself as an expert. She right now has more work than ever because clients, you know, they have this problem, they have a crisis, they, they don't feel prepared to handle it. And then they know, oh, Mireta, she is, she's amazing at this. I know I read some of her articles. Maybe we can have her set up a talk. So, I mean, that's another example of not thinking about marketing or sales so directly, more thinking about how can you put yourself in a position so people come to you because you are known as the, uh, you know, the bulletproof entrepreneur guy or the reframing person or whatever your brandable expertise is about. One good resource here, a friend and fellow uh, author at Harvard is uh, Dory Clark. She does some very helpful work there as well, uh, where your listeners can uh, can check out her work. Hmm. So now, as a follow-up to that, my question is, um, are there any methodologies you use? Because yes, you can say, okay, position yourself as an expert, solve problems that are not being solved. But me coming at it from just the layman's perspective, it might seem daunting, man. If I if I go on Forbes, Entrepreneur Inc., or even have a business review where you publish, I can read all these books and see all these articles and say, man, Everything that has kind of I can talk about has been talked about. Everything that that is supposed to be talked about has been talked about. Where can I still carve a niche in this? So, is there a way to create the process to find these gaps? I'd say so because there's an interesting perspective here. When you think about what experts do, we often think that they find new ideas to share with people. That's, in my view, actually not quite true. Uh, not always, at least. What we often do is to take old ideas and explain them to a new audience. So when you look at most of the people who write for Forbes and Harvard Business Review and so on, you'll recognize that many of the ideas, they've been around before. I mean, we have had a billion people 
talking about how to have better conversations or negotiation or whatever. What makes them different, and I think what allows them to step in, is that they, first of all, they say something that is relevant for their audience here and now. Because when you read something from 10 years ago, different situation. And secondly, and I'd say this is probably the core point for many, to look at the stories you know personally. It is so often, when I, you know, I speak to other people who want to write for HPR or similar, and they come in and they've written a story or an article draft, and it's a good draft. But then what are their examples? They use Steve Jobs or they use Elon Musk or whatever. We have heard those stories a billion times. Stop talking about Steve Jobs. I'm much more interested in hearing about the client you work with in Toronto, who's a shoe manufacturer, and nobody ever heard of them before, but they had a really interesting problem that they solve in a very creative way. So one of the core tools that I feel everybody can leverage if you've had just a few years of client experience or working with is actually to go in and find the stories that you have either been part of or that your clients have kind of you know, come up with as they work. They don't have to be Apple or Google or any of those. But on the contrary, it's often much more relatable for an audience when you talk about somebody who looks more like you, recognizing that most of us don't work in Google. (laughs) So, gee, you could go in and, and write a book right away on all the stories you've heard through your podcast. I'm sure there's a ton of stories there that deserve to have a wider audience. So I'd say that's probably one very specific tool. Try to mine your own experience and your clients work for stories you can tell that's often the key to getting popular is that you have a new exciting example of it illustrating the point that people may have heard before but they really need to hear it in a better way now mm, okay okay cool i love that i love wow you've dropped so much uh, wisdom on us today it's almost a shame to have to cut this uh, interview and end it. But um, as we start to wind down the episode mm-hmm. on the podcast, um, I have a, just a few short follow-up questions. Yes. And in this conversation, reading your book, understanding how to create new ideas, I've seen one recurring theme surface over and over again is that to become a good problem solver, you kind of must most likely have to become good at asking questions and, ask, and asking the right questions. So how can somebody... A, become not just better at asking questions, but also how to become good at listening. Because I know that listening and asking the right questions are the two keys to helping you solve complex problems. Yeah, a couple of components to it. One is to recognize that you need to be curious because often people don't listen because they think they already know the answer. Like we have an idea about why, why people are acting like they do. Instead of just saying, oh yeah, I'm probably right, then trying to be curious and dig a little deeper. So the first thing is just a mental attitude. I say the second thing is almost a a physical skill. What I do when I write research cases, I sit down, I put a piece of paper in front of me, and I write down, like not exactly what people say, but I try to capture what people say. And I focus 100% just on capturing and understanding them and asking clarifying questions. It's almost a way having that piece of paper for me is a way to avoid jumping, you know, jumping in with my own thoughts and so on. I just focus on understanding what they're doing and I do it with by capturing. It's also very helpful if somebody's giving you feedback because that frees you up from trying to react to the feedback. Your first point is just to to understand. And it's even to the point of asking you know, at the end of, as, as you do uh, in your podcast very well, I think, asking, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Or like, say more. Or when you say this, what do you mean? Why does that bother you? Almost like just a quick follow-up answers to get people themselves to deepen it out. Even just the practice, this is called mirroring, I'm sure you've heard of it, just of repeating the last three words people say. That prompts somebody to share more information. And that might even be down, this is advice from a negotiator called Chris Voss, who uses this in hostage situations and similar. But, but even just going in and saying, you know, if somebody says, well, we, we are really, uh, we really pushed on our budgets at the moment. You literally just say, pushed on your budgets, and then you, you remain quiet. And then they'll start sharing more information with you. So part of this is just training, like getting into 
this habit of doing it with your partner, with your children, with your parents, of starting to deliberately practice a different way of dialogue, almost a different way of being in the conversation. Cool, cool. And um, my final question for you today is, uh, as a noted keynote speaker, author, management consultant, writer for several publications, you know, You've probably done a lot of interviews. People have asked you so many questions over the years. But um, in your own view and in your own thought, what's the one question someone has never asked you that you've always wanted to answer or <laughs> you would like to answer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm reframing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I'm always... I mean, we we have actually covered that a little bit on this call because I I very often feel... This is a perspective when what we spoke about before with getting published in Forbes, HBR, whatever. People, many, many people ask, hey, can you connect me to your editor? They think it's about networking. And that's the wrong question because you, the connection is not going to help you if you don't have a good idea. What people don't tend to ask about, which you did actually ask about, is like, how do you develop ideas that editors want to listen to? What's the right way of approaching that? And we, we can go much deeper in um, in the domain of book writing, which I have a lot of thoughts on. Sure, why not? Somebody uh, Writing a book might actually help somebody in this time. So, yeah, if you have time to just uh, share some few words on that. Yeah, one of the key things I found is actually to be much more active in getting feedback on what you write. My first book I wrote in almost isolation with a full manuscript and then got feedback on it and it needed to be changed a lot. Uh, that added another year to the process. The second book, I started much more aggressively just sharing small elements of it and testing it in the classroom and with clients and so on. And that allowed me to very quickly figure out what people found interesting and what they didn't connect with. So I think too many people are, they don't understand the value of getting really early and constant feedback on what you're writing and testing it in reality, almost as if you are treating your book as a startup. Uh, what's a minimum viable product for your startup? Well, how do you validate the problem with your customers? That's probably one of the core things. I'm planning to write at some point a um, a blog post of uh, with all the information I learned about book writing. So I can share that with you when it's out. But one of the core things is also you should be prepared to put on weight. <laughs> I, I literally put on 10 kilos uh, while writing this book. <laughs> so it, it comes, there are certain other ways it impacts uh, your life as well, I'd say. Cool, cool. So with that said, my friend, we've reached the end of the episode. It's really been a pleasure talking to you. But before I let you go, tell us a little bit more about where people can find you, connect with you, and of course, purchase a copy of your book. So the book is called What's Your Problem? It's published by Harvard Business Press, and it's available on uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, ask your, your local book shop for it as well. You can also get more information, and there's some free things for download on uh, the website, howtoreframe.com, howtoreframe.com. And those are probably two good starting points. If you're interested in my work on innovation specifically, my first book was called Innovation as Usual, How to Help Your People Bring Great Ideas to Life. And that's also a Harvard Business Press. So I say th those three, the book, the site, and the old book, perhaps. And then in terms of, okay, somebody listening to this and saying, oh, wow, I love the concept he shared. I get the book, I read it, and I really want to be a practitioner helping companies to implement this framework to solve problems so that they can get positive results. Do you do certifications to train people? That's something I am uh, putting together at the moment, and I have more on that on the website as well, where there's also a way to contact me on howtoreframe.com. Okay, cool, cool. So I'll link to all that in the show notes and put that up once this episode is edited to go live. So thanks a lot for coming to share your thoughts, your wisdom on how to become better problem solvers. I truly appreciate you taking the time to do this during this difficult time and also teaching us some valuable skills to solve problems that will help us generate revenue and help us um, navigate the challenging waters that we currently face in this crisis. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for inviting me on. It's uh, fantastic the work you do to help people here. So I really appreciate it. 
Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in once again to the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. If you like what you heard on today's episode of the show, please go to iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast and leave a review and a comment. It helps other great listeners like yourself find the show and it tells me if I'm doing a good job or not and what type of guests to bring that can impart solid wisdom to help you grow on your entrepreneurial journey. Once again, you can always email me at info at odogwu.com. That's I-N-F-O at O-D-O-G-W-U dot com to let me know, you know, if you want a different type of guest or if you even want to be considered as a guest on the show. So till next time, guys, have a great day. Stay bulletproof. And of course, I'll catch you on the next episode of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast. <laughs>